And I'll never forget the night before. It was heavy uh, scraping, uh, aerial bombardment in the area we were going into. <clears throat> and I had felt like this was going, tomorrow was going to be one hell of a day. Being a black man in the uh, Special Forces back then, there were very few. And you really had to be top of your game. Uh, you wouldn't last. So it was a lot of pressure. Uh, not peer pressure, but pressure from everyone in the command, really. Because they're looking at you as a black man coming into the Green Beret. It wasn't obvious prejudice, but you knew you had to do We all had to say we had to do 125%. We had to stay top of our game. You know, outside the Green Beret, there was plenty of racism. Vietnam was right with it. Uh, yeah, convention units uh, had a lot of problems. In the Green Beret, normally it's man on man. We, uh, we covered each other's back. Uh, we all had the same training, and it wasn't it wasn't obvious racism. racism. We, we were brothers. It was 17 September 1969 in an area in Vietnam called Chi Lang, near the Cambodian border. I was a Mike Force commander of a company sized element. And we went on a mission to interdict the enemy disrupt his supplies and destroy his supplies. My antenna was up. I was uh, on alert with myself. Do everything right because I had that feeling. And uh, we crossed, got in there, we crossed the rice paddy. And we moved into a village. And once we entered the village, there was nobody there. There was one woman and she was singing. That really got my attention. I assumed what she was doing was letting them know that we were coming their way. And I got a radio call from my team commander, Captain Daniels, that he had been wounded three or four times, I don't know how many, and that the team sergeant had been killed, killed in action. I didn't hear any of the uh, fighting going on. I was that far back. And also he informed me that the intel sergeant has kicked a step on a mine and he was down. And so irregardless, I knew that I had to go to their aid uh, or rescue. So I immediately moved out. I reorganized my troops because I knew it was going to be a good fight. So we moved out and we came near the area where the team sergeant's body was at. Once we entered the area, all hell broke loose. I mean, there were bullets coming from everywhere. Machine gun fire, small weapons fire, and it was thick. Got several people wounded. So what I did, I we got all the weapons from the uh, company, from the battalion, machine guns and I laid down a base of fire. And the enemy returned the fire and returned it thick. So I couldn't really get to the body. So I decided I'm gonna go anyhow. So I got two volunteers, I told them cease fire, and I went into where the body was at. The time I got in there before we could get the body, the two with me got wounded. I didn't get wounded. So I had to bring them out. I brought them out, got uh, two more volunteers, went back in. We got to the team sergeant body. Through all the bullets are still coming out. Was able to get him out. Got him out and getting him out, the map case came out of his pocket. So once he was out, I decided I had to go back in. I can't let them have that. And so, I went in throwing hand grenades. 
I put hand grenades in every bunker I could find. And my turp was right behind me. So we got in, uh, we got to the map case, he got the map case. When he was getting the map case, still the enemy there, I got shot in the chest. I went down, I took the enemy out, I went down, my interpreter got the map case and he was gone. He got out of there. So now I'm by myself. So I scoot up behind a palm tree and I had to check myself to see if I had uh, the bullet had went through. Then I would have a sucking chest wound because I was hitting the right chest. And bubbles was coming out. But checking, I didn't have no uh, sucking chest wound. Okay. Now, the story is sometimes you get crazy, but I talked to my captain. He said, I came out here and uh, they'd take me up best they could, and I went back again with no shirt on but web gear and bleeding. But anyway, when I went back in, I got one more enemy. I saw him in a trench. And when I got him, I got shot again. Then I got back up behind a coconut tree, a palm tree, and they were trying to take me out. And when I got shot in the hand, I dropped my weapon. So I didn't have a weapon and I'm behind the tree and they're trying to shoot the tree down. And while they're trying to shoot the tree down, I got hit in the arm. So I'm hitting the right arm, I'm hitting the chest, and I'm hitting the left hand. And during that time, I told myself, they want to kill you real bad. <laughs> I said, it's time for me to get out of here. So the Navy was in the area with a light observation helicopter. Now they say they didn't have no heavy weapons, but they got small arms, for, small arms and they got some explosives on board. And I said, maybe dropping the uh, explosives would help. And I said, drop anything you get. I just need something to, to break the engagement. So they dropped explosives. I was able to get over to my weapon. And I don't know how many magazines I had. I fired up every one of them. And after I'm out of ammunition, I took off. I, uh, I had told my unit, if I went down to leave me, don't come back for me. So they moved out and I'm by myself. But I was able to break contact and I started to run. And while I was running, they were still trying to get me. And I think I run maybe a quarter mile, a little better with three bullet holes. And I caught up with them. And uh, they met back me. Uh, met back came in and took me out. You know, receiving a Medal of Honor, or even getting a Medal of Honor, never crossed my mind that one minute. I never even thought about it, even after the battle had been on. And so my wife got a call, uh, Colonel Davis' staff called her and said that he wanted to speak to me. Colonel got on the phone and said, it's Colonel Davis and uh, some high official I need to speak to you. And it was President Obama. And he got on the phone and he said, I want to apologize to you for not receiving the Medal of Honor 44 years ago. And I was, I was shocked. Oh, well, I never thought about the marijuana. Just like I said, I have never. And uh, I almost fell out. <laughs> and uh, he said, what I want you to do is keep it confidential for, until it's official. And it became official 10 months later. I had to keep that under wraps. And you talking about something hard to do, that was hard to do. Uh, my wife knew it, but I couldn't hardly tell. I wanted to tell everybody, but I just, yeah, that was the hardest thing I ever had to do was keep that low key. <laughs> and I told a couple of people and they started laughing. <laughs> they, they thought I was just, uh, full of it, right? Got to the White House and uh, Obama was really good. He was really good. He presented me the Medal of Honor. And uh, he told me, say, you know, uh, I apologize. And, you know, I just want to thank you for everything you did. And uh, irregardless of uh, what asked the African American about what I went through, it doesn't mean nothing to me because this is still my country and I'm patriotic and I believe it.